Good evening. On behalf of the staff at the Friedrich von Junst Library of the Forgotten in Dusseldorf, welcome, and thank you for listening to tonight's broadcast. My name is Lector Finn J.D. John, and I am the Master Librarian at the von Junst Library's Albany, Oregon branch. I know you have been accustomed to hearing my predecessor's voice bringing you these broadcasts, and I would like to apologize personally to anyone who's been disappointed to learn of the sudden resignation and subsequent mysterious disappearance of Herr Lector Gustav von Meithaus last week. In extending their invitation to me to take Lector von Meithaus's place, the Council of Prefects has made it emphatically clear that they are committed to continuing the good Lector's work in modernizing the library's trans-temporal outreach. My background as a lecturer in new media communications at a college far distant from the library's main branch in Dusseldorf has led them to believe that I have the knowledge and skills to bring the von Junst Library, with its treasure house of priceless ancient lore, into a new century. It is my firm determination to prove them right. So this evening, Midsummer's Night of 2014, a very special time of year for us here at the library, particularly among scholars of the Black Stone of Stragoikovar. Tonight, as I say, is indeed a very special occasion. For those of you who are still listening to our radio broadcast in the greater Dusseldorf area from the radio aerial atop the Great Stone Tower, I am thrilled to be able to tell you that we are joined tonight by the entire world, or as much of it as is interested in the strange and the forgotten, through our brand new podcast. Yes, that is correct. Today's radio transmission is also going out for the very first time on the Internet. It is indeed a thrilling day. Tonight is also the night we will be starting on a new volume. Lector von Meithaus, as you no doubt are aware, has just finished his reading of the fourth cryptical book of Hassan. Perhaps you are expecting me, today, to start on the fifth. But I know we have been oppressing you, loyal listeners of late, with stories full of darksome glimpses upon the outer blackness and the strange and unknowable forms of what passes for life in those vast gulfs. Today we will be turning to a more human story, an adventure story, a story of a man who, nearly a hundred thirty years ago, slipped through a trans-dimensional cleft and found his feet planted, none too firmly, upon ground that may actually be mankind's home world, the dusty, dying world we know as Mars. The source for tonight's reading is a 1912 volume by Edgar Rice Burroughs titled A Princess of Mars. Tonight we ride with Captain Jack Carter of Virginia as he tells of his mysterious journey, a journey our science still has yet to make sense of. I hope that you enjoy hearing it as much as I shall enjoy telling it. And now, let us begin. Forward. To the reader of this work, in submitting Captain Carter's strange manuscript to you in book form, I believe that a few words relative to this remarkable personality will be of interest. My first recollection of Captain Carter is of the few months he spent at my father's home in Virginia, just prior to the opening of the Civil War. I was then a child of but five years, yet I remember well the dark, tall, smooth-faced athletic man whom I called Uncle Jack. He seemed always to be laughing. He entered into the sports of the children with the same hearty good fellowship that he displayed toward those pastimes in which the men and women his own age indulged, or he would sit for an hour at a time entertaining my old grandmother with stories of his strange wild life in all parts of the world. We all loved him, and our slaves fairly worshipped the ground he trod. He was a splendid specimen of manhood standing a good two inches over six feet, broad of shoulder and narrow of hip, with the carriage of a trained fighting man. His features were regular and clear-cut, his hair black and closely cropped, while his eyes were of a steel gray, reflecting a strong and loyal character, filled with fire and initiative. His manners were perfect, and his courtliness was that of a typical southern gentleman of the highest type. His horsemanship, especially after hounds, was a marvel and delight, even in that country of magnificent horsemen. 
I have often heard my father caution him against his wild recklessness, but he would only laugh and say that the tumble that killed him would be from the back of a horse yet unfold. When the war broke out, he left us, nor did I see him again for some fifteen or sixteen years. When he returned, it was without warning, and I was much surprised to note that he had not aged apparently a moment, nor had he changed in any other outward way. He was, when others were with him, the same genial, happy fellow we had known of old, but when he thought himself alone, I have seen him sit for hours, gazing off into space, his face set in a look of wistful longing and hopeless misery, and at night he would sit thus, looking up into the heavens, at what I did not know until I read his manuscript years afterwards. He told us that he had been prospecting and mining in Arizona part of the time since the war, and that he had been very successful was evidenced by the unlimited amount of money with which he was supplied. As to the details of his life during these years, he was very reticent. In fact, he would not talk of them at all. He remained with us for about a year, and then went to New York, where he purchased a little place on the Hudson where I visited him once a year on occasions of my trips to the New York market, my father and I owning and operating a string of general stores throughout Virginia at that time. Captain Carter had a small but beautiful cottage situated on a bluff overlooking the river, and during one of my last visits, in the winter of 1885, I observed he was much occupied in writing, I presume now, upon this manuscript. He told me at this time that if anything should happen to him, he wished me to take charge of his estate, and he gave me a key to a compartment in the safe which stood in his study, telling me that I would find his will there and some personal instructions which he had me pledge myself to carry out with absolute fidelity. After I had retired for the night, I have seen him from my window standing in the moonlight on the brink of the bluff overlooking the Hudson with his arms stretched out to the heavens as though in appeal. I thought at the time that he was praying, although I never had understood that he was, in the strict sense of the term, a religious man. Several months after I had returned home from my last visit, the 1st of March, 1886, I think, I received a telegram from him, asking me to come to him at once. I had always been his favorite among the younger generation of carters, and so I hastened to comply with his demand. I arrived at the little station about a mile from his grounds on the morning of March 4, 1886, and when I asked the liveryman to drive me out to Captain Carter's, he replied that if I was a friend of the captain's, he had some very bad news for me. The captain had been found dead shortly after daylight that very morning by the watchman attached to an adjoining property. For some reason this news did not surprise me, but I hurried out to his place as quickly as possible so that I could take charge of the body and of his affairs. I found the watchman who had discovered him, together with the local police chief and several townspeople, assembled in his little study. The watchman related the few details connected with the finding of the body, which he said had been still warm when he came upon it. It lay, he said, stretched full length in the snow, with the arms outstretched above the head toward the edge of the bluff, and when he showed me the spot it flashed upon me that it was the identical one where I had seen him on those other nights, his arms raised in supplication to the skies. There were no marks of violence on the body, and with the aid of a local physician the coroner's jury quickly reached a decision of death from heart failure. Left alone in the study I opened the safe and withdrew the contents of the drawer in which he had told me I would find my instructions. They were, in part, peculiar indeed, but I have followed them to each last detail, as faithfully as I was able. He directed that I remove his body to Virginia without embalming, and that he be laid in an open coffin within a tomb which he had previously constructed, and which, as I later learned, was well ventilated. The instructions impressed upon me that I must personally see that this was carried out just as he directed, even in secrecy if necessary. His property was left in such a way that I was to receive the entire income for twenty-five years, when the principal was to become mine. His further instructions related to this manuscript, which I was to retain unsealed and unread just as I found it for eleven years, nor was I to divulge its contents until twenty-one years after his death. A strange feature about this tomb, where his body still lies, is that the massive door is equipped with a single, huge, gold-plated spring lock, which can be opened only from the inside. Yours very sincerely, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 1. On the Arizona Hills I am a very old man now. How old I do not know. Possibly I am a hundred, possibly more. But I cannot tell because I have never aged as other men, nor do I remember any childhood. 
So far as I can recollect, I have always been a man, a man of about thirty. I appear today as I did forty years and more ago, and yet I feel that I cannot go on living forever, that some day I shall die the real death from which there is no resurrection. I do not know why I should fear death, I who have died twice and am still alive. But yet I have the same horror of it that you, who have never died, and it is because of this terror of death, I believe, that I am so convinced of my mortality. And because of this conviction, I have determined to write down the story of the interesting periods of my life and of my death. I cannot explain the phenomena. I can only set down here in the words of an ordinary soldier of fortune a chronicle of the strange events that befell me during the ten years that my dead body lay undiscovered in an Arizona cave. I have never told this story, nor shall mortal man see this manuscript until after I have passed over for eternity. I know that the average human mind will not believe what it cannot grasp, and so I do not purpose being pilloried by the public, the pulpit, and the press, and held up as a colossal liar when I am but telling the simple truths which someday science will substantiate. Possibly the suggestions which I gained upon Mars and the knowledge which I can set down in this chronicle will aid in an earlier understanding of the mysteries of our sister planet. Mysteries to you, but no longer mysteries to me. My name is John Carter. I am better known as Captain Jack Carter of Virginia. At the close of the Civil War, I found myself possessed of a few hundred thousand dollars, Confederate, and a captain's commission in the cavalry arm of an army which no longer existed, the servant of a state which had vanished with the hopes of the South. Masterless, penniless, and with my only means of livelihood, fighting, gone, I determined to work my way to the southwest and attempt to retrieve my fallen fortunes in a search for gold. I spent nearly a year prospecting in company with another Confederate officer, Captain James K. Powell of Richmond. We were extremely fortunate, for late in the winter of 1865, after many hardships and privations, we located the most remarkable gold-bearing quartz vein that our wildest dreams had ever pictured. Powell, who was a mining engineer by education, stated that we had uncovered over a million dollars' worth of ore in a trifle over three months. As our equipment was crude in the extreme, we decided that one of us must return to civilization, purchase the necessary machinery, and return with a sufficient force of men properly to work the mine. As Powell was familiar with the country, as well as with the mechanical requirements of mining, we determined that it would be best for him to make the trip. It was agreed that I was to hold down our claim against the remote possibility of its being jumped by some wandering prospector. On March 3, 1866, Powell and I packed his provisions on two of our burrows, and bidding me goodbye, he mounted his horse and started down the mountainside toward the valley, across which led the first stage of his journey. The morning of Powell's departure was, like nearly all Arizona mornings, clear and beautiful. I could see him and his little pack animals picking their way down the mountainside toward the valley, and all during the morning I would catch occasional glimpses of them as they topped a hogback or came out on a level plateau. My last sight of Powell was about three in the afternoon as he entered the shadows of the range on the opposite side of the valley. Some half hour later I happened to glance casually across the valley and was very much surprised to note three little dots in about the same place as I had seen my friend and his two pack animals. I'm not given to needless worrying, but the more I tried to convince myself that all was well with Powell and that the dots I had seen on his trail were antelope or wild horses, the less I was able to assure myself. Since we had entered the territory, we had not seen a hostile Indian, and we had, therefore, become careless in the extreme, and were wont to ridicule the stories that we had heard of the great numbers of these vicious marauders that were supposed to haunt the trails, taking their toll and lives and torture of every white party which fell into their merciless clutches. Powell, I knew, was well-armed, and further an experienced Indian fighter. But I too had lived and fought for years among the Sioux in the north, and I knew that his chances were small against a party of cunning trailing Apaches. Finally, I could endure the suspense no longer, and arming myself with my two Colt revolvers and a carbine, I strapped two belts of cartridges about me, and catching my saddle horse, started down the trail taken by Powell in the morning. As soon as I reached comparatively level ground, I urged my mount into a canter and continued this, where the going permitted, until close upon dusk I discovered the point where the other tracks joined those of Powell. They were the tracks of unshod ponies, three of them, and the ponies had been galloping. I followed rapidly until, darkness shutting down, I was forced to await the rising of the moon and given an opportunity to speculate on the question of the wisdom of my chase. 
Possibly I had conjured up impossible dangers like some nervous old housewife, and when I should catch up with Powell I would get a good laugh for my pains. However, I am not prone to sensitiveness, and the following of a sense of duty wherever it may lead has always been a kind of fetish with me throughout my life, which may account for the honors bestowed upon me by three republics and the decorations and friendships of an old and powerful emperor and several lesser kings in whose service my sword has been read many a time. About nine o'clock the moon was sufficiently bright for me to proceed on my way, and I had no difficulty in following the trail at a fast walk, in some places at a brisk trot, until about midnight I reached the waterhole where Powell had expected to camp. I came upon the spot unexpectedly, finding it entirely deserted, with no signs of having been recently occupied as a camp. I was interested to note that the tracks of the pursuing horsemen, for such I was now convinced they must be, continued after Powell with only a brief stop at this hole for water, and always at the same rate of speed as his. I was positive now that the trailers were Apaches, and that they wished to capture Powell alive for the fiendish pleasure of the torture, so I urged my horse onward at a most dangerous pace, hoping against hope that I would catch up with the red rascals before they attacked him. Further speculation was suddenly cut short by the faint report of two shots far ahead of me. I knew that Powell would need me now if ever, and I instantly urged my mount to his topmost speed up the narrow and difficult mountain trail. I had forged ahead for perhaps a mile or more without hearing further sounds when the trail suddenly debouched out onto a small open plateau near the summit of the pass. I had passed through a narrow overhanging gorge just before entering suddenly upon this table land, and the sight which met my eyes filled me with consternation and dismay. The little stretch of level land was white with Indian teepees, and there were probably a half a thousand red warriors clustered around some object near the center of the camp. Their attention was so wholly riveted upon this point of interest that they did not notice me, and I could easily have turned back into the dark recesses of the gorge and made my escape with perfect safety. The fact, however, that this thought did not occur to me until the following day removes any possible right to a claim to heroism which the narrator of this episode might possibly otherwise entitle me. I do not believe that I am made of the stuff which constitutes heroes, because in all of the hundreds of instances that my voluntary acts have placed me face to face with death, I cannot recall a single one where any alternative step to that which I took occurred to me until many hours later. My mind is evidently so constituted that I am subconsciously forced into the path of duty without recourse to the tiresome mental processes. However that may be, I never have regretted that cowardice is not optional with me. In this instance, I was, of course, positive that Powell was the center of attention. But whether I thought or acted first, I do not know. But within an instant, from the moment the scene broke upon my view, I had whipped out my revolvers and was charging down upon the entire army of warriors, shooting rapidly and whooping at the top of my lungs. Single-handed, I could not have pursued better tactics, for the red men, convinced by sudden surprise that not less than a regiment of regulars was upon them, turned and fled in every direction for their bows, arrows, and rifles. The view which their hurried routing disclosed filled me with apprehension and rage. Under the clear rays of the Arizona moon lay Powell, his body fairly bristling with the hostile arrows of the braves. That he was already dead I could not but be convinced, and yet I would have saved his body from mutilation at the hands of the Apaches as quickly as I would have saved the man himself from death. Riding close to him I reached down from the saddle, and grasping his cartridge belt drew him up across the withers of my mount. A backward glance convinced me that to return the way I had come would be more hazardous than to continue across the plateau, so putting the spurs to my poor beast, I made a dash for the opening to the pass, which I could distinguish on the far side of the tableland. The Indians had by this time discovered that I was alone, and I was pursued with imprecations, arrows, and rifle balls. The fact that it is difficult to aim anything but imprecations accurately by moonlight that they were upset by the sudden and unexpected manner of my advent, and that I was a rather rapidly moving target, saved me from the various deadly projectiles of the enemy, and permitted me to reach the shadows of the surrounding peaks before an orderly pursuit could be arranged. My horse was traveling practically unguided, as I knew that I had probably less knowledge of the exact location of the trail to the pass than he. And thus it happened that he entered a defile which led to the summit of the range and not to the pass which I had hoped would carry me to the valley into safety. It is probable, however, that to this fact I owe my life and the remarkable experiences and adventures that befell me during the following ten years. 
My first knowledge that I was on the wrong trail came when I heard the yells of the pursuing savages suddenly grow fainter and fainter, far off to my left. I knew then that they had passed to the left of the jagged rock formation at the edge of the plateau, to the right of which my horse had borne me and the body of Powell. I drew rein on a little level promontory overlooking the trail below and to my left and saw the party of pursuing savages disappearing around the point of a neighboring peak. I knew the Indians would soon discover they were on the wrong trail and that the search for me would be renewed in the right direction as soon as they located my tracks. I had gone but a short distance further when what seemed to be an excellent trail opened up around the face of a high cliff. The trail was even and quite broad and led upward and in the general direction I wished to go. The cliff arose for several hundred feet on my right, to my left was an equal and nearly perpendicular drop to the bottom of a rocky ravine. I had followed this trail for perhaps a hundred yards when a sharp turn to the right brought me to the mouth of a large cave. The opening was about four feet in height and three to four feet wide, and at this opening the trail ended. It was now morning, and with the customary lack of dawn, which is a startling characteristic of Arizona, it had become daylight almost without warning. Dismounting, I laid Powell upon the ground, but the most painstaking examination failed to reveal the faintest spark of life. I forced water from my canteen between his dead lips, bathed his face, rubbed his hands, working over him continuously for the better part of an hour in the face of the fact that I knew him to be dead. I was very fond of Powell. He was thoroughly a man in every respect, a polished southern gentleman, a staunch and true friend and it was with a feeling of the deepest grief that I finally gave up my crude endeavors at resuscitation. Leaving Powell's body there where it lay on the ledge, I crept into the cave to reconnoiter. I found a large chamber, possibly a hundred feet in diameter and thirty or forty feet in height, a smooth and well-worn floor, and many other evidences that the cave had, at some remote period, been inhabited. The back of the cave was so lost in dense shadow that I could not distinguish whether there were openings into other apartments or not. As I was continuing my examination, I commenced to feel a pleasant drowsiness creeping over me, which I attributed to the fatigue of my long and strenuous ride and the reaction from the excitement of the fight and the pursuit. I felt comparatively safe in my present location, as I knew that one man could defend the trail to the cave against an army. I soon became so drowsy that I could scarcely resist the strong desire to throw myself on the floor of the cave for a few moments' rest. But I knew that this would never do, as it would mean certain death at the hands of my red friends, who might at any moment be upon me. With an effort I started toward the opening of the cave, only to reel drunkenly against a side wall and from there slip prone to the floor. That's all we have time for tonight, listeners. This broadcast is a production of the Friedrich von Junst Library of the Forgotten, with branches in Dusseldorf, Strigoikovar, and Corvallis. At present, the only way to learn more about the library is to plan a journey to Dusseldorf on a clear, moonless night or to Stregoikovar at midsummer. However, in the next few weeks, the Council of Prefects has committed to having a website approved, to which you may look for further edification at any time. I will have further news of this project on future broadcasts. Thank you once again, listeners. Good night.